truly amazing, isn't he? We are going to start this service with a, a question. Do you believe the glory of the Lord will change your life? What I mean is, you know, the glory of God, we, we all know that God is with us, he, he's, you know, he's everywhere, but when his glory shows up, his, his manifest presence, where heaven meets earth, and, and you, you actually feel the presence of God, does that change your life? If maybe you said, hey, you know, I've never experienced that, that's okay, you can and as we go through this sermon, hopefully your heart will be stirred. And if you have experienced that, do you want more? Do you want more? It's more than just coming to church. It's more than just getting online and, and clicking in. It's getting to that place of intimacy with God. God knows you inside and out, and he wants you to know him inside and out. As, as much as we possibly can as being humans. But see, he will reveal himself to those who seek him. Psalm eleven seven says, For the Lord is righteous. He loves justice. Upright men will see his face. When it talks about his face, it's, it's going beyond just the asking things from God, the, the praying and saying, God, I need this, I need help, I need that. That's, that's when you're seeing his hand bringing you help, whatever your situation. But if you want to see his face, that's intimacy, that's closeness, that's getting to know who God really is. It says it's, it's upright people. Basically meaning people that have a heart that want to do good and to please God. You know, nobody's perfect. You know, it's not about being perfect that you see God's face. But it's having that heart that you're wanting to do good all the time. You're wanting to please God all the time. Those are the ones who will see his face. In Psalm 61, written by King David says, hear my cry, O God, listen to my prayer. From the ends of the earth I call to you. I call as my heart grows faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. That's Jesus Christ. For you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the foe. I long to dwell in your tent forever and take refuge in the shelter of your wings for you have heard my vows, O God. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. Increase the days of the king's life, his years for many generations. May he be enthroned in God's presence forever. Appoint your love and faithfulness to protect him. Then will I ever sing praise to your name and fulfill my vows day after day. The Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. And his heart's cry was, God, I want to be in your presence forever. He knew that God was with him wherever he went, just like we know that. But getting into his presence, the glory of God, where that takes a heart that seeks him, that wants him, that pursues him. David knew that, and David got there. Psalm 103 Verses 1 through 8, it starts out with blessings of, of those who, who know God on that personal level. And it's a good reminder saying, Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. See, Moses knew God personally. 
That's why God revealed his ways to him. The other people in Israel knew what God did. They saw his deeds. They saw the miracles. They saw the great deliverance, you know, that God did getting him out of Egypt. But Moses knew him on an intimate level. Kind of think about it today in a, in a silly sense, but a true sense, a celebrity, right? You, you, you see what they do, whether you know, they're an athlete or a politician or an actor or whatever. You see what they do, you read the headlines, you, you know about that person, but that person's spouse really knows them personally because they're with them day after day. They share their heart with one another Let me ask you, do you know about God or do you know him? You know, and that's this is not a condemnation type thing. It's it's a heart check of where we're at. Be honest with yourself. Do you know about God? Do you come to church? Do you get the sermons? Do you, you know, do all raise your hands during worship? Or do you know him personally on an intimate level where he's revealing himself to you? And you're getting to know him in a deeper way. Exodus 33, verses 7 through 13. It says, Now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp, some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went, in, went out to the camp, all the people rose and stood at the entrance to their tents, watching Moses until he entered the tent. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tents, they all stood and worshipped each at the entrance to his tent. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. Do you know you can have that now? Do you know that through Christ Jesus you can have that intimate relationship with God that you speak to God face to face as a friend? That he wants to speak to you. He was waiting every day for you to just come. Let's be honest, it takes time. It takes time to develop a relationship. My wife and I have been married 22 years. Our relationship is deeper and more intimate now than it ever has been because we spend time every day with one another. We look into each other's eyes. We tell each other we love each other every day. We kiss each other. We share what's on our heart. We laugh. We have fun. We work, we work hard. We do all these things. And our relationship has gotten closer and closer and stronger and stronger. What's your relationship with God like? Is it just the once a week, you you know, you kind of get your religious fill in? Or are you intimate with God, looking at him day by day? Kissing him, telling him you love him sharing your heart with him and letting him pour out his heart to you. Is your relationship like this with God or is it like this? Nobody can get you here except you. Doesn't matter how many sermons you hear, doesn't matter how many worship times you have, unless your heart is fully committed to God to get here. It says, Moses talked with the Lord face to face as with a friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young aide, Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. There's something about not leaving the presence of God. Song of Solomon says, don't be in a hurry to leave the presence of the king. When God is moving, when you feel that presence of God, don't be in a hurry to get out of that. (laughs) Let him release you. You don't get out of there. Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways, so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation 
is your people. Remember Psalm 103, verse 7, where it said that Moses knew God's ways, but the people his deeds. Moses' heart was, God, teach me your ways. He was asking for that. He wanted to know God on a personal level. He wanted to go beyond just the stories he heard of Adam and Eve and of Noah and and all the, the great exploits, you know, coming up before his time. He wanted to know, God, who are you? I know about you, but who are you? And his, his said, teach me your ways so I may know you. Ephesians 1 says, God, give me a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that I may know you. That should be our heart cry. Not just knowing about you, God, but help me to know you personally. And it says, God's response to him in verse 14, the Lord replied, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Oh man, that's, that's, that's heart God's response to all of us <laughs> that have that heart saying, teach me your ways so I may know you. God says, my manifest presence is going to be with you, and I'm going to give you rest. It's a rest knowing that even in the storm, you can be sleeping <laughs> as Jesus was, because he knew his father was taking care of everything. That you can have rest in God, knowing that God's going to take care of everything, because you get it. You know that he's your loving father, and he loves you more than you can imagine or dream. And once you grasp that with that time with him, then it's like, whew, why did I ever worry ever in my life? God is with me always. He has all power to take care of this. I can rest in the presence of God. In verse 15, Moses said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and all your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? So Moses realized if God's presence with us, his manifest presence, we will be changed will be changed in, for, for the better. That whenever we enter into the, the presence of God, he will change us for the good, and that will be a uh, distinction from anyone else on the earth. And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked, because I am pleased with you, and I know you by name. Then Moses said, now show me your glory Again, revealing Moses' heart, saying, God, I want to know your glory. Is that where your heart is today? Just be honest with yourself. You know, because there's times where we're just, I'm just happy where I'm at. That's okay. That's where you're at. But if your heart is, God, show me your glory, meaning I want to know you on a deeper level than I've ever known you before. If that's where Moses' heart was, And God honored it. And we go down in chapter 34 and verse 5. It says, Then the Lord came down in a cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet, He does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of their fathers to the third and fourth generation. So God reveals more of himself to him. God had never, before Exodus 34, before that time in history, God had not revealed that part about him. But because Moses' heart wanted to go deeper with God and know him more, God revealed more of who he was. And it's the same with you. We, we, don't, we don't have it all. I don't care if you've been a Christian all your life. You don't have all the answers, and, and you don't know everything completely in this word. You don't know God truly who he is unless he reveals it to you. But he will reveal more and more and more to you the more that you long after him, the more that your heart cries out to him. And he will show you who he is. In uh, Exodus 
34, verse 29 and 33 through 35. It says, When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the tent of the testimony in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. When Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face, but whenever he entered the Lord's presence to speak with him, he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what had, um, what had been commanded, they saw that his face was radiant. Then Moses put the veil back over his face until he went in to speak to the Lord. See, God... His glory came upon Moses. Moses spent time, at that time he spent 40 days and 40 nights just with God. And when he came back, his his face glowed. He didn't even realize it. It's by being in that presence of God that it reflects God's glory. It's the same with us. You know, think about like the sun, right? It has all the power and the energy. It has all the light, The moon doesn't have the light. It has no light. But it reflects the glory of the sun to bring light. And it's the same with us. We don't have the glory in us. We don't have all the things of God. But as we spend time with him, that glory reflects off of us. And people see a change in our lives. In Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 2, 23 and 24. It says, This is what the Lord says. Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom, or the strong man boast of his strength, or the rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts, boast about this, that he understands and knows me. That I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. If you want something to boast about, boast about that you understand and know God. (laughs) Because there's nothing else to boast about. Everything that you have, everything that's been given to you, talents, abilities, anything and every, has been given by God. So it's saying there's nothing we can boast about except that we understand and know God. I love it how he says we understand and know God. It goes into that deeper level again. It's not just knowing about God, but we understand him. Have you ever read something in the Bible and like, why did God do that? If you haven't, you haven't read enough of the Bible. Because <laughs> there's stuff in there that you're like, God, what? I'm not quite getting this, but you seek him and you pray and you ask the Holy Spirit to reveal and you study and God begins to reveal through his word and by his spirit. But we boast in knowing him and only him. And in Jeremiah 17, starting in verse 7, it says, But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. He will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green and has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward a man according to his conduct, according to what his deeds deserve. You know, we can be like that tree. (laughs) That tree that is constantly being fed by the word of God and by the spirit of God. You know, and, and as a tree, it's like your roots go down deeper and deeper. The more nutrition you're getting. And the more that we spend that time with God, get into his word and pray and just receive more of his spirit, the more our roots go down that when the the bad times come, it doesn't knock us over. And we're full of life because God is giving us his life, his abundant life, and not just the life of this world that has nothing to offer. And God is the one who searches our hearts, examines our mind. He shows us, he begins to reveal to us the things that we need to change in our lives. Now, nobody likes change, but we all need it. And if we do it, 
and we do it properly in God's ways, we become better for it. And in Ezekiel uh, chapter 47, verse 12, is talking about the, the river of God that was flowing from the sanctuary from heaven, coming down here on earth. And it says that fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fail. Every month they will bear, because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food, and their leaves for healing. Fruitful trees, full of life, healthy and strong. Don't you want to be like that? A fruitful tree that's strong and healthy and just bearing fruit, being blessed, and then you blessing others? That's by the river of God. God said, I'm going to give my spirit. It's, it's like a well rising up in you, the river of life. Being in the presence of God in a way that it just touches us and changes us. And what happens is when you get satisfied with God, then you become un unsatisfied quickly because you're like, man, I want more. <laughs> I want more of God. Have you ever been in, in a place where just the presence of God just, just came down and you're just like, oh my gosh, there's just, there's just peace and there's just joy, there's just this freedom and this victory and you just feel like you can do anything because God is there with you. It's like we, we can have that in our homes. <laughs> we can have that in our church. We can have that where we go. And, and it's not like it's just you know, 24-7 that you're just, but it's, it's those times that we take out of our day. Not letting our day run us and trying to squeeze Jesus in it, but it's letting Jesus run us. And that just kind of takes care of the day. That you're putting the time and the effort with Jesus first and foremost in your life. You're saying, God, I want you more than my job, more than my money, more than my wife and my kids more than my church and my ministry. I want you more than everything. That's the heart that God is looking for. And then guess what? He blesses you at your job and with your spouse and with your kids and with your church and your ministry and so forth. It's like we don't want to let those things go and we want to put them priority because they need priority. But the more that we let them go and put God as priority and first, the more God takes care of all those things and he changes us to be a better husband, to be a better father, to be a better friend, to be a better pastor, to be a better worker, to be a better whatever. But it's saying, God, I surrender and I want you and I want that river to flow into my home. What's the atmosphere in your home like? Is there peace there? Is there joy there? Is there love there? Is there hope there? Or is it kind of chaotic? You can change that by turning on the worship music, by getting into the word of God, by praying, by seeking his face and saying, God, be in my home. Your presence, your glory that will change me and my family and all who walk in here. In John 3, Verse 34 through 36, it says, For the one whom God sent speaks the words of God. For God gives the Spirit without limit. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in his hands. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. I love that verse in verse 34, where it says that God gives the Holy Spirit without limit. It's basically, as much as you want of him, he's going to give you. It, it, it's our choice. It's like God has, is just ready to pour into you more and more and more of him. And that begins to, you, you understand him more. You, it, it brings that peace and that joy and all the, the blessings of God. But it's the, he has it without limit. So it's just however much you want. 
And just like going to the physical faucet or going to your fridge and getting a bottle of water and, and drinking it, the more that I drink, the more it's going to quench my thirst, which I'm going to do right now because I'm thirsty. It's refreshing. God's bottle never ends. But I have to physically go to God to get his water. I, I can't just be a Christian. It's like, yes, we're saved and Jesus is in us, the Spirit's in us. Great. But is that it? Is that all? Or is there more? The Word of God says there's more for those who want it. For those who have a heart like David, saying, I want to be in your presence. For those who had a heart like Moses, says, show me your ways so I may know you. For those like Ruth who clung to Naomi and said, hey, wherever you go, I'm going to go. Your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. I, I'm not letting go. How bad do you want God? Because he has more to pour into you every single day. Every day he has more, his spirit without limit, to pour into you. But you have to make the choice, how bad do I want him? How bad will I get into his word and say, God, teach me, show me. God, fill me with your spirit. Let your river flow into my home, flow into my heart, flow into my church, flow, uh, flow into my neighborhoods. The amount that we want him, the amount is what he's going to get. Because if I don't ever open the fridge and get this out, I will continue to be thirsty. And if I don't go and spend time with God every single day, spiritually, I will be thirsty. And he has more to give, more than I could ever ask for or imagine. And second, oh, and the bottom of that, sorry. Jesus is the key <laughs> to all of this. Because he says, the Father loves the Son and has placed everything in his hands. Whoever believes in the Son, that's Jesus Christ, has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. Without Jesus Christ being first and foremost in your heart, none of this applies to you whatsoever. <laughs> God will not pour into you anything and everything. It's only through his Son, believing in his Son, that he sent to die for us. We receive eternal life through him, or if we reject him, we have God's wrath. So the key is, if you haven't had Jesus in your heart, ask him today. <laughs> Say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins, come into my heart, and live there forever. And then all this is available to you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 3, it says, You you show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. That, you know what? You know, with Moses, you know, he wrote on the, the, the Ten Commandments on these tablets of stone. Now, with Jesus Christ, he, he writes with the Spirit of God on your heart. That never goes away. He's writing his love letter to you. He's, he's writing the word of God. Showing you who he is. And how much he loves you. And it says such confidence in this is ours through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves. But our confidence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant. Not of the letter but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. God is writing that new covenant on our hearts. It's a covenant of grace and truth. The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. That Christianity is wonderful if we fully understand God. Some people focus too much on the do's and don'ts instead of that relationship with Jesus. See, reading the Bible does not change you, but reading it with a heart to know the one who wrote it will change you. 
You know, if we're, we're just going through the motions, again, if we're just showing up just every Sunday, but our heart isn't into it, it's not into God, then we need to say, God, change me. Soften my heart up. Make it where I'm passionate about you. Remember when, when Jesus asked Peter, you know, he said, do you love me? In the Greek word, phileo, he's asking him, do you love me as a friend? And he's like, yes, I love you as a friend. Well, actually, he, he was asking her, do you love me agapeo, which, which is like a, a deeper love, that intimate love, that self-sacrificing love. And Peter said, I love you as a friend, but I'm not there yet in that intimacy with you. But we, sh- we can be honest with God and say, God, I'm not there. I'm not there yet. Peter eventually got there. He gave his life for Christ. He was crucified upside down for him. He got there of that deep relationship with God. And we can be honest with God and say, God, my heart is not where Moses' heart was or David's heart. But make it there. It's not like Ruth, but make it there. It's not like Peter or Paul, but make it there, God. And God will honor that prayer. Just keep seeking him. Reading the Bible alone does not change you, but reading it with a heart to get to know the one who wrote it will change you. You're not just reading this to get a check off that you did your religious duty. You're reading it to know God in a personal, more deeper way. And if you have that heart, he'll reveal to you more and more and more than you could ever imagine or dream. In verse 7, it says, Now if the ministry that brought death was engraved in letters on stone came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, fading though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that condemns men is glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness. For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was fading away came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? So he's going back to, you know, Moses, what we read before, where he would spend time with God, and God gave him the Ten Commandments and and a whole bunch of other commandments. There's there's a lot more commandments of God than the, the Ten but his face glowed, but that, that eventually wore off. And he was saying, you know, the old covenant, it had glory because God was glorious. It was good because God was good. His law was good, but man failed repeatedly, just like we do today, of breaking the laws of God. And so it wasn't the perfect covenant on our end because we kept breaking it. And so that glory faded. But now we're in a new covenant with Jesus Christ under grace and truth that if we believe Christ is the Savior, we ask him to be the Lord of our heart and we we believe that God raised him from the dead, that Jesus lives inside of us. And then now we become righteous, not because we're perfect, but because Jesus fulfilled the law that we couldn't fulfill. And now the new covenant is perfect in glory because not only is God glorious and perfect, but he has made us perfect and glorious in him. And only by him. That's why no one can boast. Nobody can say, I'm super righteous, because you're not. (laughs) You're a super sinner who's saved by grace. And so all glory goes back to him. It all goes back to him. But that glory in us, that now in the New Testament, we can, can rise up as believers and say, man, we, we have a glory greater than Moses had because the Spirit of God is actually living inside of us. We are actually cleansed of our sins. We don't have to do sacrifices like they had to do. You know, I was thinking about the, the other day. You know, it's like, oh man, I'd hate to do all that stuff. But it was part of the law that they needed to do, to enter into the presence of God, because no one was, was perfect. But now Jesus, living that perfect life on the cross, he died, taking away the sins of you and I who believe in him, 
that we could enter that, that holy of holy, that place where God is, his glory, his manifest presence, that you have that opportunity, I have that opportunity every day to go into the presence of God. We have a glory far outreaching what we can imagine or dream that God wants to reveal himself to you. It's not just for pastors. It's not just for people, you know, uh, evangelists and stuff. It's for you. It's for everybody who wants to take the time every day to enter into the presence of God and say, God, let your glory come. Let your presence fill this place. Fill me with your spirit overflowing and reveal yourself to me. Having that heart. If you want him, he's going to give himself to you. We have the opportunity. There's no excuses anymore. It's not like, oh, once a year the high priests go in there and visit with God. No, it's every moment, every morning, every afternoon, every night. You have the privilege to go into the most holy of holies and spend time with the king of the universe. Isn't that amazing? Yes, it is. Think of the person that you would want to spend an afternoon with on this earth. You would make time to spend with them, wouldn't you? Now you have God to spend with. Is your day being ran by all the stuff? Or is it being ran with a relationship with God as being the center and first? In verse 12 it says, Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses who put a veil over our face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away. But their minds were made dull. For to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Again, Jesus is the key. If we don't have Jesus in our hearts, none of this applies to you at all. We cannot understand the Lord or his word unless we turn to Jesus Christ and give him our heart. Then that veil is taken away and reveals himself to us. And lastly, in verse 17 and 18, now the Lord is the spirit, and when the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory. Remember the sun and the moon. (laughs) We reflect God's glory. We are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. That ever-increasing glory. God doesn't increase in his glory. He's he's all-glorious all the time. But we here on earth, we are ever-increasing in our glory by becoming more and more like him. And how do we become more and more like him? By spending time with him. You know, it's the old thing, right? The uh, friends that, that can finish each other's sentences because they know what's going on in their mind. They've spent that much time that they know what's in their heart and their mind. Can you finish God's sentences? Are we that close with him? I'm not there. I want to be there, and I'm putting time and effort into it. I'll be honest, there's times I I come up here just to spend time with God, and, you know, I got all the things of the world and my mind, and just my heart's not in it. (laughs) But I make myself, I make myself stay in the presence of God until I feel that manifest presence, until I see the glory of God. And sometimes it's 15 minutes, sometimes it's an hour, sometimes two hours, sometimes three, sometimes more, but I won't go until God shows up. And I wish I did that more. But it's the heart. Where are we at? You have to put effort into it. You can't just show up to church and say, okay, God, just do it. That's, that's not a heart after him. That's a heart just barely getting through the motions. But a heart that says, God, I want you more than my wife, my kids, my home, my money, my job, my anything, everything. I want you to be enthroned in my heart. I want to know you more than anything and everything. 
I want to know your glory and know your heart. I want you to speak to me. I want to be able to hear you clearly. I want to walk with you daily. And I want your glory to just fill the place where I'm at. When we get to that place, we are truly changed. Because God is bringing us to ever-increasing glory, becoming more and more like him. So let me ask you one last time. Do you believe the glory of the Lord will change your life? What are you going to do about it now? God, we confess that our hearts are not where they need to be. But we ask that you'd forgive us and that you would give us hearts like David, hearts like Moses, hearts like Peter and Paul and Ruth and Mary, Give us hearts that are after you, that you are our first and foremost, above anything and everything else in our lives. And we know that you'll bless all those other things, but we give them all up to you and say, God, be enthroned in our hearts right now, that you give us a passion for you, a passion for your word, a passion for Jesus Christ, a passion for the Holy Spirit, that every day we don't let the day run us, But we, Lord, spend the time with you and let you run our lives. Dying to ourselves so that you might live through us. Increase, Lord God, the hunger and the thirst for you in our lives. And we thank you for it. We thank you you give your spirit without limit. So however much we come to you, you'll give more. And so we just look forward to the rest of this day and tomorrow and every day spending time with you and being in the glory, the manifest presence of God. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Go and be blessed. God's waiting for you. Go spend time with him in a deeper way. Amen. Be blessed.